Good morning. You may be seated. This morning's scripture reading is on the Lord's Supper, and it's in Paul's first um, letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, starting with verse 18. And if you don't have a Bible, there's one under your seat. And if you don't have one at all, feel free to take that one home for your use. So we'll begin in 1 Corinthians 11, 18 through 29. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. (laughs) What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Then in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 through 21, the cup cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I apply then? That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to participate to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And then finally in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 30. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. So if you send someone you love a gift, you have three tiers of options. Um, You got the U.S. Postal Service, USPS, it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, You have the United Parcel Service, or UPS, been around since 1907. Or you have another tier, which is sort of the FedEx, DHL tier, both of which were formed in the 1970s. That's what you have. Now, Barbara read from three wonderful passages about the the precious uh, sacrament or ordinance called the Lord's Supper. And I thought it'd be good sort of as a one-off to kind of talk about this. We did baptism last week, Lord's Supper this week. And my best shot at distilling all of these passages, all of this content into a single message is this in a nutshell. The Lord's Supper is the UPS of heavenly gifts. Now, Let me explain. I'm not trying to be hokey, corny, whatever. Uh, In his son, 
God the Father uh, sent to earth his very best gift. And then Jesus rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven, right? So now through Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God still sends very good gifts from heaven to earth, often through surprising means and vehicles, but he also chooses sort of regular regular de delivery vehicles that the church has historically called sacraments. And I'll explain what sacraments are later. They're a kind of mysterious ritual. I'll get into that later. But the everyday vehicles through which God delivers his gifts, the everyday kind are the word, prayer, and people. That's what the church has historically recognized as everyday gifts. Word, prayer, and people, those are, are the vehicles through which God delivers Gifts. And, and this would be like God's U.S. postal vehicles, right? USPS vehicles, right? Designed to come every day, deliver gifts of wisdom, of guidance, of help, a sense of his presence. We're supposed to get this every day through the word, prayer, and other people. The beautiful but more occasional vehicle of baptism, like we celebrated last week, which was a wonderful celebration, by the way. I love doing that with you guys is, uh, I would say, DHL. Now, DHL shows up to my door just a few times a year, but it's always exciting because if it's from DHL, it means it's probably rare. Uh, it's going to be maybe p possibly exotic, definitely precious gift, maybe even coming from far away. So I love it. And we learned last Sunday that, that baptism reinforces the work of Jesus through a reenactment. And it's a gift to all of us but for the person being baptized, it's one of those one-hit wonder kind of gifts, right? You usually do it once in your life. It's rare. Now, were we to see uh, one day baptisms at the rate of an Amazon Prime vehicle? <laughs> that would be pretty great. Like, I definitely wouldn't say no to that, right? Thank you, Lord. But somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle, regularly but not daily, you got UPS, right? And the Lord's Supper. And, and I don't use this image, I, I hope you believe me when I say it. I'm not using this image simply to be sly or clever or get your attention. My hope is that it would put into our minds an image that would forever stick. That when you see these trays up here, or, or when you get those sort of prepackaged elements of the Lord's Supper, you might rightly be expectant that God is about to deliver to me gifts from heaven. Like true, wonderful gifts that I get to take with his people. And, and his word specifically mentions delivering four wonderful gifts to heaven from us. They are a, a visible version of the good news, a family reunion, communion with Jesus, and a celebration. So we're first going to learn about these gifts, all right? Then we're going to take time to receive and experience these gifts by, by partaking of the Lord's Supper together in a way that I think will be somewhat unique to many of us, all right? So first, the learning. Number one, the Lord's Supper delivers to us a visible version of the good news. So the good news about Jesus begins with, with God, our Creator, who, who was and is so full of love that his love overflowed into the creation of human beings whom he asked to love him back with all of who they are and to love their neighbor as much as they love themselves. But sadly, the first human beings decided to love self more than God and to love other things more than they love their neighbor. And that's, that's a tragic pattern that continues to this day such that, that all of begin life actually separated from God. But thankfully, God's love, which is so great, he didn't let his love for us wane. At just the right time, he sent his one and only son to this earth to live the perfect life of love that we couldn't live and out of love to die the death that we deserve so as to, to reconcile us into our relationship with God forever. Now, I just told you the good news, but there is a way that we can show one another the good news as well. And that's what this Jesus follower named Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, one of, the, one of the passages from which Barbara read. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Now, another way to say proclaim 
can be translated preach. And in this way, the Lord's Supper is like a visible sermon. And some of you right now are wishing, I wish I just got that sermon and not this one right now because it's gonna, I could tell it's going to go on forever. It's not, I promise you. And that's very similar, by the way, this visible sermon idea to what we saw last week in baptism. Right? And I'll say something very similar to what I said last week, that if there wasn't so much history behind the Lord's Supper to walk in on adults drinking grape juice from tiny plastic shot glasses would look, at best, kind of weird, right? At worst, kind of cultish. <laughs> like, what are these people doing? But we've been around it a long time. There's a lot of church history behind it. I want us to also, though, consider how gracious God is in asking us to do it. Jesus' listeners and his early followers were primarily, really exclusively, auditory learners. Scholars say that only about 3% of the people who were around Jesus and listened to him could actually read. They listened. But God was also gracious because he anticipated a time of visual learning. And in fact, we live in an age, right, where people would prefer not to read the book and instead watch the movie, right? Right? or watch the show streaming on Netflix or HBO or whatever it might be, right? The Lord's Supper is a good news movie for those of us who may never read the book. The Lord's Supper is like a good news movie for those who may never read the book. And I'm not just saying this on my own. I'm telling like one of my favorite heroes of the faith, a great church father named Augustine, he called the Lord's Supper a visible word. Uh, a reforming guy named Calvin, uh, an, old, an older guy, said that the Lord's Supper represents God's promises in a painted picture. Right? And that's, that's the beauty of it. We get to see the good news about Jesus on display, on the stage, visibly. The bread is a reminder that he, he chose to put on this, this stinky, restricting, decaying flesh, right, that and then patiently live the perfect life of love that we couldn't live. And that's why one of the reasons, like, when I, when I take it the Lord's Supper and, and the flesh of my hand touches that bread, I'm reminded of that transaction that he made, right? That he substituted his flesh for ours. That his record of loving in the flesh, he substitutes for our, our record of failures in the flesh. And he says, take this all of you. The cup represents for us that the choice he made was a bloody choice. And yet in drinking it, we say, yet, God, we know this was a great sacrifice, and yet we know we still need it. And so we eat of it and we drink of it. And as we visibly watch one another eat of it and drink of it, the necessity of his death gets reinforced deep in our souls. Yeah, I need that. I need to take that. I need to be reminded of that. So that's the first thing that the Lord's Supper delivers to us, that, that, that visible good news. The second thing, the second deliverance that, that God's, the Lord's Supper gives to us is it delivers a family reunion. Every time we witness the Lord's Supper taking place in the New Testament, it's always among God's family members. It's, it's never something people do in private. Which is always kind of a weird thing to me because sometimes people get delivered the Lord's Supper in private, and I understand it has to happen in some cases, but in general, it's supposed to be with one another. Now, I also get that we all went through a pandemic, and, and these little, you'll see them here, these, these prepackaged elements were as a result necessary, and if you, are still, you still feel safer because of a compromised immune system or whatever, we're going to have prepackaged elements available later for you if you need it. But I think one of the downfalls of doing it that way, and we partook of the supper, is it kind of put us in our own private bubbles, right? We had everything. We could stay in our seat. We could just, it could just be me and JC together, right? Our, but our our own bread, our own cup, neat and orderly, but it also kind of feeds our own individuality, right? And maybe even a sense of self-centeredness. In the New Testament, the Lord's Supper always accompanies an actual supper, a family meal. 
And we'll talk about a little bit more why that is in a little bit. But it always accompanies a family meal. And such a family meal is the concept of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Think about it. Community suppers, by their very nature, draw us out, even challenge our sense of self-centeredness, don't they? So I had a good friend of mine uh, from the East Coast come out to San Francisco on business this past Tuesday. And and Tuesday morning, he just texted me and said, hey, can I come over to your house to eat? Uh, So he joined us. And of course, we said, yes, you're welcome to come. So he joined us at the O's for Taco Tuesday. Great time, right? Tons of toppings were put on the table, but the main thing was the taco meat. And before serving my guests, I went straight for the meat. Like I went forward first. Didn't even, honestly didn't think about it. Something that my good friend, uh, she's not in the room right now, pointed out. All right? Now, she's back with the kids in children's ministry. I wanted to subtly like go like that, but that ruined that. Anyway, <laughs> in meals with others, for me, whether it's serving people or just, just kind of conversationally, meals often expose my self-centeredness. <laughs> Paul challenges the people in the Corinthian church in the same way. He says, for in eating, each goes ahead with his or her own meal. He says, what? I love that line. I laughed when when Barbara read it. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? It's not the Lord's supper that you eat. So if I might summarize what Paul is saying here, it would be like this. If my faith is going to be private and self-centered, I might as well just eat at my own house for Ryan's supper. My name is Ryan, by the way, if you're here for the first time. I'm also eating my own house for Ryan's supper, but if you're going to be with the Father's family, then it's the Lord's supper together. So after eating a meal together, the early church family would then have a, a partake of the formal sacrament called the Lord's supper. And it's in this context that Paul then says, And uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now notice, I want to read that last one again. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Notice that Paul not only leaves out the word blood, he doesn't say discern the body of Christ. He says, discern the body. These verses are behind this tradition that when you take the Lord's Supper, we all take some time to be silent and confess wrongdoing to God before we eat and drink at the Lord's Supper. And that is a good habit. It's it's helpful. We've done it here. But when Paul says we are examining ourselves, we are discerning, it's not just for any wrongdoing. It's discerning the body, the body of Jesus, Jesus' followers the family. He didn't say the body of Christ. He didn't say the elements, who Jesus is. It's the the body of Jesus' followers. It's the family who's discerned. So the big thing here is when we partake of the Lord's Supper, it gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves, not about just have I sinned in general, but have I hurt someone in God's family? Does that make sense? Discerning the body, examining ourselves. So here's the big question you might want to ask yourself before taking the Lord's Supper. Have I hurt the family of God either through self-centered action or self-centered inaction? Have I made an effort to know these people, to serve them, to care for them, or am I simply, do I kind of come and take from them? And sometimes it hurts to have to confess. Now, God is a forgiving God, and he loves us, and he forgives us, and we still have to ask that question. So the Lord's Supper gives us a pointed opportunity to examine ourselves about our relationship with the rest of the body, the rest of the family of God. And so as we take the bread, and we take the cup, and we eat it, and we drink it, we remember that Jesus' death isn't just to reconcile us to God, but to reconcile us with one another. The Lord's Supper then gives us an opportunity to truly get a reunion with the people of God. Not just the reunion when we think about it, a picnics and wiffle ball or whatever it might be, but a reunion in the sense of actually bringing each other together because we're asking the question, God, 
Do I need to ask forgiveness for acting selfishly towards someone in this family? Or not acting at all towards people in this family? That's a gift that God gives us. A third gift God delivers through through communion or through the Lord's Supper is communion with Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, the cup of blessing is not participation in the blood of Christ. The bread we break is not participation in the body of Christ. Uh, The Greek word koinonia can be translated as participation, sharing, or as the old uh, King Jimmy version used to mention it, it's communion. Which is why you hear the Lord's Supper sometimes translated as communion. It comes from this old King James version. Paul then uses two examples to hammer home his point that, that there's a communion between us and Jesus that happens when they were taken to the Lord's Supper. Two examples when Paul's people, the Jewish people, would make sacrifices for sin. Part of the animal they would bring for the sacrifice would be eaten by the sacrificial priest. And then whatever was left over, the family that came to give the sacrifice, they get to eat the rest. And it says, you know, eat of it, participate in a meal, enjoy it. Talks about this back in Deuteronomy. Well, anyway, in verse 18, Paul says, Everyone who eats the sacrifices are participants in the altar. In other words, these families aren't just eating, but they're making real contact with heaven, between heaven and earth. Something real is taking place there. Similarly, if the Roman people sacrifice an animal to the Roman gods, then eat that food. They're not just eating food. They're participating in the spiritual world, or they're making contact, as Paul says, with demons. That's why we had that demon talk earlier. They're, they're, they're making contact with the spiritual world. So back to the Lord's Supper. Paul is saying that there's this mysterious sort of transactional communion that passes between me and the risen Jesus whenever I partake of the Lord's Supper in faith. There's something that takes place there when in faith I say, okay, Jesus, I know I need this. I know I I have to have this because you have died for me. I need your sacrifice in my life. I've always been uncomfortable with merely saying the Lord's Supper is a symbol. It is that. It is a visible word, but it doesn't do it justice, I don't think. Because of what we read here in 1 Corinthians 10, there is real communion that takes place. And I also have to say, because I've, I've just personally experienced the mystery of this communion, um, the term sacrament meanders through the Latin, but it, it sort of originates with the Greek word mysterion, a mystery. And, and I hesitate. The Lord's Supper is a mis- mysterious communion that takes place with heaven. And I hesitate to explain that much more because you can't explain a mystery. You can only experience it. And I'll just say that I'm someone who rarely gets emotional in public, but almost every time I partake of the Lord's Supper, the Lord brings me to tears. There is something that takes place in that moment, and it's wonderful. It doesn't save you, right? It doesn't make you right with God, but it's this beautiful transaction that happens between me and the risen Savior. Fourthly, a fourth gift is the Lord's Supper delivers a celebration It's a celebration from Matthew chapter 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and after blessing it broken and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and saying, drink of it, all of you. So Jesus here gives thanks. He literally Eucharists, which will sound familiar to any of you here who might be Catholic or former Catholics. You may have heard this word, the Eucharist, right? All right. Now, having said that, Jesus made metaphorical statements all the time. So, for example, Jesus said, I am the vine, or I am the door. But people didn't try to cut Jesus because he was a vine. They didn't knock on him because he said, I am the door, right? When Jesus gives his disciples the bread and says, I am the bread, they didn't automatically confuse it with his flesh and start gnawing on Jesus' arm. Yet, that, that is what the official teaching of the Catholic Church says. That when the priest blesses the elements, the bread becomes Jesus' body and the cup becomes Jesus' blood, even though his disciples clearly knew the distinction. Even still, when we give thanks, when we Eucharist, that is why we say we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It is an act of thanksgiving, an act of Eucharist. We celebrate together. 
And it was after the blessing that Jesus hands out the bread and the wine. The reason for this is Jesus' disciples were celebrating a Jewish Passover meal together. Now, without going into all the details of what a Passover meal was, just know this, the, the third cup that people sort of partook in in a Passover meal is the cup of blessing. And it pointed back towards Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, where we hear, I, the Lord, will deliver you from slavery. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. So what happens here is the Lord's Supper becomes the new Passover meal in which God's people celebrate being delivered from slavery to sin through Jesus' redeeming sacrifice. So it's a new Passover meal. We're, we're delivered from slavery to sin. We're freed from that prison through Jesus' redeeming sacrifice and not through a literal lamb. The Lord's Supper is a costly celebration because of what it cost Jesus. The very best celebrations are, not all of us have experienced that. Some of our war veterans here have. Reno, Phil, I bet they have. Times when celebrations we're keenly aware of where we could have or should have died. And so afterwards we celebrate being alive because we overcame, or rather someone overcame for us on our behalf. I was thinking this week about the celebration of life for my mom after she passed away a few years ago. And during that celebration, I, I got up at the end to, to give the eulogy. And I remember at the end of my eulogy, I read some parting words um, for each of her grandkids. They were sitting up here, up front, all together, her grandkids. Even the old ones were weeping. Even the teenagers, right, the ones who never, used to, never saw cry before in your life, were weeping, had their arms around each other. And eventually, they were laughing. Right? They, were, they were celebrating my mom's life. They were experiencing the kind of deep joy that sticks with you long after, but only made possible because of a death, right? So the very last book of the Bible features a great celebration where all the Jesus followers are together in one place. Everyone, All the Jesus followers who ever lived, you can imagine that, are together in one place and they're all wearing special clothing. You know, it's not tuxedos or even tuxedo shirts or anything like that. They're, they're, they're wearing robes now made white. Now, they're made white, right? You, you, would, you would think, how is a robe made white? Well, we're told in Revelation, they wear robes now made white because they've been washed in the blood of the Lamb which is this unique thing. You wouldn't think that would happen, but that's what happens when you combine death with a celebration. It, it leads to a kind of rejoicing and deep joy that you don't get anywhere else. So sometimes when I, when I look up here and I see the, the dark purple uh, shimmering from the, from the cups of the Lord's Supper, I'm reminded that Jesus really shed blood, drained from his body, which should have been mine. And yet he's the one who says with joy, drink it, all of you. Celebrate, I have redeemed you. He also, by the way, says he won't drink it again. Did you notice that in Matthew 26? He won't drink it again. That is until I drink it with you, I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, I never heard anyone preach on that verse before, to, to, to preach about the, that wonderful privilege. You know, right now, Jesus is the only being with a body among all the spirits in heaven. He's the only, only being with, there's nothing else that's physical right now in heaven with God. Thus, he refrains from wine. <laughs> he waits until the day when the Bible says that he will bring heaven to earth. That, that his dwelling place will be with humanity, that he will reunite us with our bodies and all the wrongs on this earth will be made right. For millennia, Jesus has been saving his next glass of wine for that moment. For when he can celebrate with us at the consummation of his father's kingdom come here on earth, think about what a privilege that is. 
Every time you raise your cup on a Sunday, rejoice that Jesus will next raise his with you here on earth. And imagine how sweet that will be here in wine country. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the gift that is the Lord's Supper, that you gave us this, this visible version of the good news about what you did on our behalf. That we can look back on that, Jesus, and, and remember the costly sacrifice, but also look forward to the day when we, you raise a glass with us again, when you come to this earth to make all things new. New bodies, new earth here in Sonoma County. What a privilege that is. Thankful, thankful, Father, that we get to do that together. It's not something we just do alone. We get to do this with your family and celebrate together.